Welcome back to Introduction to Logic. This is Module 6. Last week we familiarized ourselves with the logical operators of propositional logic. This week we use that information as we move into propositional calculus. Our main objective in this module is to learn how to use eight basic rules of inferences, seven rules derived from those eight basic rules, and 10 rules of replacement or equivalencies. Now since our purpose for learning these rules is to be able to construct logical proofs in order to demonstrate the validity or invalidity of a given argument, we should first make sure we understand what a proof is and how a proof basically works. Once again, much credit and thanks goes to philosopher James Feaster for the free open access material he made available online as he developed his own course in logic. Now some arguments are rather straightforward and simple. If P, then Q. P is true, so Q is true. Yet some arguments can become quite complex. And so we should learn how to construct a proof in order to demonstrate that the conclusion indeed follows from the premises given, or else perhaps that it does not. Now the first thing we should do is give each premise its own line and go ahead and number the line. Then we move the conclusion off to the side and we see this is the basic form of our argument. Next we're going to draw a line beneath this and then beneath that line start listing our proofs line by line. The line we are currently working on may refer to any line above it and for each line we're going to give it another number. We're going to list some new piece of information and then to the side, we're going to identify the lines from which that information came and the method by which we came to that information. And we continue in this manner until we have made explicitly clear how we went from premise one to the conclusion. Now, at this point, you have hardly any of the tools that you will need to construct the proofs for many of the arguments that we will encounter. However, you do have just a few tools. In the last module, we covered four common deductively valid argument forms. These are four of the basic rules that we will cover in this module. So I made sure that this example can be demonstrated with the information that you have at this point. But while it's the point of this module to teach you many of those rules that you need to be successful, I do think it's helpful if you understand what a proof essentially is and what it does and how it works before you just start memorizing the rules to then apply to it to make it work. So in this case, we went from if P then Q to the conclusion that Q, and all the information is there, but it's not explicitly clear how we got there. So we need to draw that out to make it clear. So we need to start a new line and add some new information. Now we can get not R from the information given because we know that S or not R from line three, and from line four, we know that S is not the case. Now in the last module, we learned that one of the common deductively valid argument forms is called a disjunctive syllogism. And that comes in the form this or that, not this, so that. So based on lines three and four, we know that using a disjunctive syllogism, we can come to the conclusion not R. So we start a new line, line five, we present the new evidence, not R, and to the right, we note how we came to that conclusion. Line three and four, disjunctive syllogism. Now that we've proved not R, we can offer a further piece of evidence. Look at line two, R or P. Well, we just provided the proof for not R, and based on that same rule or argument form, the disjunctive syllogism, this or that, not this, so that, we can also conclude R or P, not R, so P. So line six in our proof would give the evidence P, and we came to that conclusion based on lines two and five by way of a disjunctive syllogism. Now we can come to the conclusion of Q, because if P then Q, line one, and P is true based on line six, therefore Q must be true. And we know this because of the modus ponens, 
which you should recall by now comes in the form if p then q, p is true, so q is true. So line seven of our proof, the final line would give the evidence q and show that the evidence was reached based on lines one and six by way of modus ponens. This is what it means to construct a proof. And our goal for this module is to acquire a wide variety of tools so that we can approach and construct proofs for a wide array of arguments. So let's dive on in and begin with our eight basic rules of inference. Our first rule is one I'm sure you've known for a long time. A double negative leads to a positive. So our first rule is called a negation elimination. It can be represented with negation sign E, or more commonly, since it's a form of double negation, it can be represented with DN. If I have a proposition that says something to the effect of, it is not the case that this is not the case, then the double negation allows me to simplify that to a positive statement. If it's not the case that Bob is not here, then I could rephrase this to say, it is the case that Bob is here. So if I'm constructing a proof for something like if P then Q, and I have no P demonstrated already, if somewhere in my argument or demonstration it has already been shown that it is not the case that not P, then this rule will allow me to assert a new line of evidence, P. Next is the conditional elimination, which goes by the name modus ponens. And you should already be familiar with this valid argument form. If you have if P then Q, then if P is demonstrated, we can conclude Q. And as demonstrated earlier, we can represent this in our proof with the abbreviation MP. Now here's one you've not encountered in this course yet. The conjunction introduction or introducing a conjunction says that if you have proof that P is true and you have proof that Q is true, then since they're both true, you can assert the conjunction that P is true and Q is true. So if it has been demonstrated that Bob is here, and if we also have evidence that Joe is here, then it is safe to assert by way of the conjunction introduction that it is true Bob is here and Joe is here. And we can represent it in our proof with the abbreviation CONJ. So when we have two true proposition sentences and we need to conjoin them in order to construct the proof, then we can introduce a conjunction. But sometimes we first have a conjunction and we need to prove only one of those things conjoined. In this case, we will need the conjunction elimination. Conjunction elimination simplifies our proposition. And so it is also called simplification. And we represent it in our proof with the abbreviation SIMP. We simplify the conjunction by simply eliminating one of the options. If P is true and Q is true, then if both are true, then each one is true. So I can simplify my argument by setting one of these true things aside and focusing on the other. If I need P because my first premise says, if P then Q, and I do not have P anywhere demonstrated in my argument or proof, yet I do have P and Q is true, then I can simplify P and Q, setting Q aside in order to prove P. And once I've demonstrated P, I can then conclude from my first premise, Q. I personally think that this rule and the next rule make a lot of sense if we think in terms of a roadmap. If not, disregard this. If so, perhaps this will help. If you are in Central Florida heading south on I-75, as you get closer to Tampa, you will eventually come to a split. 75 continues on one side, 275 continues on the other. As I'm sure you already know, the terminology for this sort of thing that we encounter on a highway is called a junction. 
A junction is where we have a merging or verging of roads. One road splits into more than one or several roads come together and become one. Now when you reach this junction heading south, if you take 275 heading south on into Tampa, you will eventually come to another junction. This is where 275 meets I-4, which runs out of Orlando. And the two merge, and then 275 continues on to St. Pete. Now notice that in this relatively short journey from just north of Tampa down through Tampa on to St. Pete, we encountered two types of junctions. First, we were on one road that split into two, and then we had to make a choice. Then as we continued on the road of our choosing, we eventually came to another junction where our road and another road came together into one. These two types of junctions represent well, I think, the conditional elimination and our next rule, the introduction of a disjunction. First, we encountered the disjunction. It was true that 75 takes us south. Then we encountered a disjunction where it is true that 275 would take us south or it was true that 75 would continue south. And perhaps this is also a good example of the inclusive nature of a disjunction because whichever path we take, it is still true that the other path leads south. However, we do have to choose and this is why we have this or that. If we are going to continue to drive south, we cannot drive south on both roads at the same time, so we have to choose this one or that one. So one proposition, P, 75 heads south, became a disjunction when I encountered new information. P, 75 heads south, or Q, 275 heads south. Once we get to Tampa, 275 turns west for a time, and it merges with I-4, which has been heading west for a long time. Since we are now using a different example, let's use different variables so we don't confuse ourselves. So let R stand for the proposition that if you stay on 275, it will carry you west out of Tampa towards St. Pete. And assuming someone on I-4 is driving west, let S stand for the proposition, if you stay on I-4, it will carry you west out of Tampa to St. Pete. Now whether it is still called I-4 after heading west on Tampa, or whether it becomes known only as 275, doesn't matter. The propositions each claim, if you stay on this road heading west out of Tampa, you will reach St. Pete. Now R is true and S is also true, but what good to us is the information that I-4 will carry us west out of Tampa to St. Pete if we are not on I-4, especially if the main name given to the road coming out of Tampa is 275, the road that we're on. Now that could be a confusing detail for someone on I-4 driving for the first time through Tampa to St. Pete. In this case, when you go through those confusing road changes and names of the road change, it might be especially helpful to know the road that I'm on now, I-4, if I stay on it, I will head west out of Tampa and reach St. Pete even if the name of the road changes. So that's helpful information in one context, but not our context, for we are not on I-4. We don't really need that information then, and so we should set it aside and focus on the fact that if we continue on the road that we are on, we will continue west out of Tampa and eventually reach St. Pete. So in this case, we begin with two pieces of information, R is true and S is true, or R and S but we don't need S. Because they're both true, each is true, we can get rid of S and focus on the truth of R. R is what we need in order to reach our conclusion as to whether we will reach St. Pete. 
So maybe that helps, maybe it doesn't. Either way, we're moving on. So this second junction was an example of simplification, the last rule we looked at. The first junction was an example of this next rule. Disjunction introduction, also called addition, because we are adding a simple proposition, and so we can represent it in our proof with the abbreviation ADD. So addition, in the form of a disjunction, says if I have one statement that's true, I can go ahead and assert that that statement is true or another statement is true. It doesn't matter whether the other statement is true or not, because if I have reason to believe that the first is true, then it will always be the case that the first is true or the second is true. And so if I know that Bob is here, then I can safely conclude Bob is here or my head turned into an octopus. If I know that today is Monday, I can safely state today is Monday or tomorrow all the stars will fall from the sky. The point is that in contrast to the conjunction introduction, in which you have to have proved that two different things are true in order to assert them together, here, with addition, you only have to have evidence for this. You only have to know that this is true in order to logically assert this is true or that is true. The elimination of a disjunction is a little more complex. This involves starting with P or Q and then showing that if P is true, then R follows, and if Q is true, then R follows, Therefore, since we began with premise P or Q, we can safely conclude R. If we know that P or Q, then what this disjunction elimination says is that if one of them obtains, then R must obtain. And since we've already asserted P or Q, then we know that one of them obtains. Consider the argument that the U.S. will launch a nuke or Russia will launch a nuke. Now supposing there's reason to believe that if a nuke is launched, everyone on the planet will die, then one might make the move that if the U.S. launches a nuke, everyone will die. If Russia launches a nuke, everyone will die. Therefore, everyone on the planet is going to die. This rule is more commonly called a constructive dilemma and it is represented within the proof by the abbreviation CD. Our last two rules of inference involve the introduction or elimination of the biconditional. First, we have the biconditional introduction, which is also called material equivalence, and it is represented with the abbreviation ME. And this is where we have two conditionals which imply a biconditional. For example, if P then Q shows up in our argument or somewhere in our proof thus far, and if Q then P has also been shown. From this, we see what shows up in the biconditional, if P then Q and if Q then P, so we can go ahead and translate it to biconditional terms. P if and only if Q. If it has been established that if I go to the movies with you, then you will pay for my ticket, and if it is true that if you pay for my ticket, then I will go to the movies with you, then we can safely conclude that I will go to the movies with you if and only if you pay for my ticket. The elimination of a biconditional is just the opposite. We're still talking about the same thing, really, just from the other direction. And so it's still a form of material equivalence, which we abbreviate ME. And we will go deeper into rules of equivalence next. But for now, we just need to understand that if we are given a biconditional statement, P if and only if Q, if we need things to be stated in terms of a conditional in order to solve for the conclusion or demonstrate our proof, then this rule allows us to just eliminate the biconditional operator and exchange it for two conditionals. P if and only if Q means if P, then Q, and it also means if Q, then P.
So this rule of implication or inference allows us to move from a given by conditional to a restated conditional. Now technically, if you want to dissect what's going on here, there are technically two moves involved for the by conditional implies a conditional and another conditional. P if and only if Q implies if P then Q and if Q then P. But recall what we learned from the conjunction elimination earlier. If two things are understood to be true, then any one of them is true. So I don't have to assert them both. I can simplify it to just one of the two things asserted. Now, in most cases, when we have a conjunction, we have an extra step in which we identify the elimination of the conjunction or the simplification. However, with this rule of implication, it's understood that a biconditional implies that either conditional must be true. So we can kind of skip that middle step in this case and go directly from a given biconditional to one of the conditionals. So if I know it's the case that P if and only if Q, then because I understand that this means both if P then Q and if Q then P, I can go ahead and just state if P then Q. So suppose we were given the statement Q if and only if P. If we have P demonstrated as an evidence in one of our lines of proof, then we can go ahead and conclude Q. Why? Because the biconditional Q if and only if P implies that the statement if P then Q is true. And we have evidence for P, therefore we can go ahead and conclude Q. Now this could never happen with a conditional in the form if Q then P. Because in that case, we would have to demonstrate the Q in order to move to the P. But because the premise was asserted as a biconditional, and a biconditional implies two types of conditionals, either of which is true, then as long as we can prove P, we can solve. As long as we can prove Q, we can go ahead and solve. And the way that we do that is by eliminating the biconditional, translating it back in terms of the conditional, and then moving forward with a basic modus ponens. Jill is here if and only if Jill's ugly boyfriend is here. From this biconditional, we already understand that if Jill is here, then her boyfriend is here. So if we see Jill, we know he's here. From this biconditional, we also know that if the boyfriend is here, then Jill is also here. So if we don't see Jill, but we see the boyfriend, we already know that Jill is here. Okay, so let's pause here for a little practice. Given the statement, not R and S, therefore not R, how can we prove this? We can prove this because the rule of simplification tells us that if we have a conjunction of two true things, then either one of them can be asserted independently. So if it's true that not R and S, then it's also true S, or it's also true not R. In this case, we simplify to not R. This, of course, was an easy example, so let's look at something more complex. Assuming that it's not the case, that P is not the case, and assuming that P is the case if and only if Q is the case, it follows that if P is the case, then Q is the case. And we have reason to believe P, therefore Q is the case. So R or Q is the case. Thus we can conclude that P is the case and R or Q is the case. How did the author of this argument get to that conclusion? Well, they began with a material equivalence by eliminating the biconditional and simplifying it to one of the conditionals that it implies. If it is true that P if and only if Q as line two asserts, then we can conclude that if P then Q. And we do have evidence that P is the case because line one assumes a double negation. 
that it is not the case that P is not the case. It is not true that P is not true, thus P is true. Now, of course, we have what we need in lines three and four to conclude that Q is true by way of modus ponens. But where in the world did R come from? Well, it came from the introduction of a disjunction. Remember, as long as you have evidence for one of the options in your disjunction, the other option can be whatever you assert it to be. So we know that Q is true now, so we assert, therefore, R or Q is true. And we could have said Q or R. Recall that it does not matter. So this evidence comes from line 5 by way of addition. Now we see that all the author did to conclude P and R or Q was to conjoin lines 4 and 6. Now, assume that A is the case. And in theory, if B, then C. So suppose if A, then B. Now notice that the language of my assumptions is coming in different forms but we're assuming lines one through three. Now, based on this theory, it follows that B. Therefore, we can conclude C. So here, line three and line one give us a classic modus ponens. If A, then B, A, therefore B. So in constructing our proof, we note on line four that this evidence comes from lines three and one by way of modus ponens. And because Line two tells us if B then C, and line four tells us B is the case, we can now conclude C is the case also by way of modus ponens. All right, so these are our basic rules of inference or implication, but we also have some derived rules. That is, from certain things we understand, we can derive other things that follow. For example, modus ponens tells us that if P is true, then Q is true. So if I have P, I have Q, but if I find that Q is not the case, then this brings P into question. So from modus ponens, if P then Q, P, so Q, we can derive the modus tollens. If P then Q, not Q, therefore not P. If Bob is here, then we are in for big trouble. But it is not the case that we are in for big trouble. Therefore, it is not the case that Bob is here. If A, then B, not B, so not A. We conclude this from lines one and two by way of modus tollens. Next, we have the hypothetical syllogism. If we are given if P, then Q, and we are also given if Q, then R, then we can see that proving P will lead us to R. So the hypothetical syllogism, which is abbreviated HS, comes in the form if P, then Q, if Q then R, therefore if P then R. If you look back, then you will turn into a pillar of salt. If you turn into a pillar of salt, then the deer will lick your face for eternity. Therefore, if you look back, then the deer will lick your face for eternity. We've already encountered the disjunctive syllogism, abbreviated DS, which tells us that if P or Q is true, then given not P, we can conclude Q. Remember, the or is inclusive. If we know that one of this or that is true, we do not necessarily know that the other is false. However, if we know that this or that is true, then if we have reason to believe that one of these is false, this affirms clearly that the other is the one that is true. To say it another way, as long as I know that this or that is true, I do not really have evidence as to which one it is. If I prove this, it could still be the case that that is also true, but I have not proved that to be true simply by proving this. However, if I prove this to be false, and I know that this or that is true, then this necessarily points to that as being true. For example, we will have hot dogs for dinner or we will have hamburgers for dinner. It is not the case that we will have hot dogs for dinner. 
Therefore, we will have hamburgers for dinner. Now note that if you began with we will have hot dogs or hamburgers and then you proved that we're having hamburgers, you've not actually disproved the possibility of having both. It is often common when people cook out that they cook hot dogs and hamburgers at the same time. So it's possible. However, if you know that we will have hot dogs or hamburgers and you disprove the fact that we're having hot dogs, then we're left with the conclusion that we are having hamburgers. Next we have the rule of absorption, abbreviated ABS. This rule is derived from what we know of the introduction of a conjunction. Recall that if we know that P is true and we know that Q is true, then we can conjoin them and assert that both together are true. So if P is true and if Q is true, then P and Q is true. Well, understanding that they can be asserted conjointly then, if we begin with a conditional, if P, then Q, then we can assert a conjunction within part of our conditional. If P, then P and Q. If Bob is here, then we are in for big trouble. This would mean that if Bob is here, then Bob is here, and we are in for big trouble. But why say that, right? Well, as you're starting to see, hopefully, there is a need as you construct your proof to use only what you are given. And sometimes you have to take what you're given and translate it into a language that will better fit the moves that the author is trying to make. So sometimes you may see the pieces of what you need, but they may not be fitting together in the way that you need them to in order to get to the conclusion. So sometimes you will need within your demonstration of proof to, so to speak, translate the language into a, a way that can flow clearly to the conclusion. Next is the constructive dilemma. Remember, a dilemma is kind of like a disjunction in the sense that you must choose between this or that. You are constructing a different dilemma or disjunction than the one you began with. So if we begin with P or Q, and if we have reason to believe that if P then R, and if Q then S, Mom will come home first tonight or Dad will come home first tonight. If mom comes home first tonight, then we will have hot dogs for dinner. If dad comes home first tonight, then we will have tofu for dinner. Therefore, we will have hot dogs for dinner or we will have tofu for dinner. So in this case, constructing a proof, we would show that R or S comes from lines 1, 2, and 3 by way of a constructive dilemma, which we can abbreviate as CD. Next is the contradiction. If you run into a contradiction, then you have escaped the bounds of reason. This is true and not true, and we're not talking about rational things anymore, so any conclusion would follow. The whole argument would be, of course, problematic. So if we begin with evidence that P is true, and we find evidence for not P as being true, then we can go ahead and conclude anything we want because we're not talking about logical things anymore. For we have said that P is clearly true and it's clearly the case that not P. For we have evidence backing both of these claims. And you could of course have fun with this. Bob is here and it is not the case that Bob is here. Therefore my head just turned into an octopus. So to be clear, the reason we are having fun with this is because if you assert two propositions as true that contradict one another, then the whole world of logic falls apart and anything is possible. And you may well encounter people who assert contradictory things. So if you encounter an argument that assumes a contradiction like this, you may find the argument proceeding in the following way. Based on line one, we can conclude by way of addition that P or Z is the case. Therefore, we can clearly conclude Z based on lines 3 and 2 by way of a disjunctive syllogism. 
Now notice here, the logical moves that the person is offering are fair. What doesn't work is the contradictory assumption they began with. And you can encounter contradictions in your arguments, and so you need to be able to find them when they show up. So in an argument this short, we would just identify this as a contradiction and waste our time no further. Now if this showed up in a lengthier argument, further down the line, then it might be beneficial to help the person making the argument out by uh, logically analyzing the argument up until that point, then identifying the contradiction where the argument derails and then going no further, and like Socrates, encouraging them to start again. Of course, Socrates tended to do this in a more sarcastic manner that came in the form of, oh, something has gone wrong, but I know that you know what you're talking about. So we should probably go back and start over and try it again. I know you've got some great wisdom for me and I'm eager to learn what it is. Now some arguments may need to assert a theorem. A theorem is a well-formed formula that is a tautology. Recall that a tautology is a statement that is logically necessary, such as the statement, it is not the case that Bob is here and Bob is not here, which can be simplified symbolically as not, and then in parenthesis, P and not P. If there is a tautology that we have need of in order to complete our demonstration, because it is a necessary logical truth, it is permissible to go ahead and assert it. And so we can just assert it as a theorem. So here's an example. Suppose an argument says X or X or Z. It's not the case at X, therefore Z is the case. Now you can probably see in a sense, you can understand how the negation of X would seem to get rid of the possibility of X is true or X is true. And even if you can see it, even if it makes sense to you, it is your job as a logician, even if a temporary one for this course, to make explicitly clear how the premise leads to the conclusion. And nothing can be assumed or just left up to what we see. Everything needs to be carefully accounted for. So we begin with X or X or Z. And we understand the disjunctive syllogism by now. So if we could get not X or X, then we would clearly be left with Z. The problem is that we don't have not X or X. We only have not X. Now there is a maneuver here that you do not have yet, although you will have it in just a matter of moments. De Morgan's Law allows us to translate what we're about to do into the language of not the case that X or X, which then allows us to resolve the dilemma but we cannot even get there if we don't first have something to work with. And that something is not X and not X. For now, let's just understand that we've got not X, and if we can get not X and not X, then we will be able to translate it into the language that we need of not X or X to then eliminate that option and leave us with Z. Now, how do we go from not X in line two to not X and not X? Well, the way that we do that is by introducing a theorem or a tautology. And if you haven't picked up on it already, the abbreviation for theoretical introduction is TI. What is the tautology that's being asserted here? Well, if I know that P is the case, it's an obvious truth that P is the case and P is the case. And yet it's fair game to assert that. It's so obvious that it would seem that we would not usually need to say it. And yet there may be a case in which doing so will be of benefit to our proof. And this is such a case. We know from line two that not X is true. We would not normally have to assert Therefore, it's the case that not X is true and not X is true. But in this case, that is exactly what we need. 
So from line two, by way of theoretical introduction, we can now assert not x and not x. And then using that line, line three, by way of a tool we will have in just a moment called De Morgan's Law, we can translate that into the language of not the case that x or x. And this allows us to conclude z by way of lines one and four and the disjunctive syllogism. And the last of our derived rules, not our last rule to know in this module, but the final of our derived rules of inference or implication, is repeat. Repetition comes in the form of P, therefore P. I'm not going to say this again, therefore I'm not going to say this again. Now we do not, of course, usually speak this way, but we do encounter this in everyday language, although it does not quite show up this way, especially because we like to say things in different ways, and this is why redundancy can even become a problem. But suppose you hear a mother or father telling a child, I'm not going to repeat myself, so I'm not giving you another warning. They're essentially saying the same thing. I've already told you, I'm not going to tell you again. This is your final warning. So we might translate it to, I'm not going to tell you again or warn you. Therefore, I'm not going to tell you again or warn you. When they say, I'm not going to repeat myself, they're trying to communicate that this is your last warning. And then they follow it up with a sort of redundancy for the sake of clarity, perhaps. I'm not going to give you another warning, which is another way of saying I'm not going to tell you again. But it is a form of repetition. And as we try to unpack and analyze our logic and construct our proofs, we, of course, try to simplify the language. And once we simplify it, we're really saying P, therefore P. And although we will likely not often encounter it, it is possible that we may encounter it within an argument. And so we need to have the tool to do so. So when we encounter or make use of this move, we identify it by the abbreviation RE for repeat. Now I encourage you to pause and learn the rules we've discussed thus far well before moving forward. Now we only have about 10 more rules to learn. Unfortunately, these are the most difficult and demanding in this module. Now in one sense, they're trying to make things easier for you. When you run into a wall trying to work out a proof in one direction, you may can simply translate the language of the proof in order to continue working it out from a different angle. In that sense, they're very helpful, just like stopping to think about something from a different perspective. The difficulty comes in that the language used in equivalence often carries a number of operators in the mix. We've actually seen some of the simpler ones so far. Double negation. We know that a double negative equals a positive. But to translate a positive into a double negative, we already have two operators in the works. Two tildes or negation symbols. Or think of our material equivalents, the biconditional. To translate the biconditional, we now have to have two conditionals operating. But what we're talking about here is not necessarily making the simplified move from one biconditional to one conditional. There may be times that you have to make a more complicated move, and that involves even more operators than just a conditional. So again, at this point, I encourage you to pause, go master what you've learned so far, and then come back to continue. Now our rules of replacement, also called equivalencies, are rules that allow us to replace one well-formed formula with another, another that is logically equivalent to it. Unlike the rules we've already looked at, these apply to both the complete premise and also sub-well-formed formulas within a premise. In other words, if our main premise has several operators in the mix, such as P if and only if Q, or R and not S, and it's also true that not R or S 
One rule of replacement will allow us to replace the sub well formed formula, not R or S, and translate it into the language of not the case that R and not S. On the other hand, if our main premise is a little simpler, even if it does not seem so at first glance, such as in parenthesis P and Q, in parenthesis, or in parenthesis, not P and not Q, in parenthesis, we can translate this to a biconditional P if and only if Q. Now, just so there's no confusion, a symbol of four dots marking four corners of a square is a symbol that can be used to represent a biconditional, for which we use the symbol of a double-sided arrow. We are using this four-dot symbol primarily because it makes it easier to recognize equivalencies. So when you see these four dots, you think what is on the left is equivalent to what is presented on the right. So for our purposes here, think of the equivalency symbol that we are designating here as a sort of equal sign, where we are saying that the well-formed formula on the left is logically equivalent to the well-formed formula on the right of the symbol. Now in module one, we briefly surveyed the history of logic, and you should recall from the algebraic period of the 1800s that we briefly mentioned the significance of Augustus de Morgan. De Morgan was a British mathematician and logician, and he is celebrated for both introducing the term mathematical induction and also formulating certain principles which have come to be known as De Morgan's Laws. According to De Morgan's Laws, the negation of a disjunction is the conjunction of the negations. So to say it's not the case that A or B is the same as saying it's not the case that A and it's not the case that B. And the negation of a conjunction is the disjunction of the negations. So to say it's not the case that A and B is the same as saying it's not the case that A or it's not the case that B. For example, if it is not the case that I ate a banana and an apple for breakfast, then we may safely conclude that either it is not the case that I ate a banana or it is not the case that I ate an apple. It may be the case that I ate neither, but we cannot safely and logically make that assumption. So based on the rule of equivalence, if in our proof we have to account for not P and Q, we can translate this to not P or not Q. And so as we construct our proof, we could present not P or not Q on a new line. We would cite the line containing not P and Q and then note that we came to this conclusion by way of De Morgan's law. And likewise, if we encounter it's not the case that P or Q in the argument, and we need to translate this into the language of it's not the case that P and it's not the case that Q, De Morgan's law allows us to do this. Now, if it helps with some of these, I'm trying to provide a mnemonic tool to help you remember how to distinguish between some of these rules. For De Morgan's Laws, it may be helpful to remember AND equals OR, because what you're essentially doing is converting a conjunction, an AND statement, to an OR statement, or you're converting an OR statement, a disjunction, to a conjunction. When noting De Morgan's Law in your proof, you can use the abbreviation DM. The next rule is commutation, abbreviated C-O-M. Here it will be helpful to think and equals and, or, or equals or, because essentially all you're doing is converting a disjunction into the same disjunction phrased differently, or you are converting a conjunction into the same conjunction phrased differently. Now we understand that in a conjunction or a disjunction, 
The simple propositions can switch places and not change the meaning of the overall proposition. However, even though we know they mean the same thing, P or Q is not explicitly and clearly presented in the same way as Q or P. And since the point of our logical proof is to be as explicit as possible, to make our reasoning clear and distinct, if we have P or Q, and what we are working toward in our proof is phrased Q or P, we cannot simply swap them around. We have to account for that in one line of our reasoning. So we would introduce a new line, swap the simple propositions, and note the line that we changed and that we came to this new evidence by way of the rule of commutation. Our line of reasoning is clearest when we continue to use the same phrasing. And if we need to change our phrasing, then we need to note that we are doing so so that we can continue to remain as clear as possible. Next, we have the rule of association. It is abbreviated ASSOC. Association allows us to move parentheses whenever we have a series of disjunctions or a series of conjunctions. So for example, in a disjunction, to say P is true or Q or R is true is the same as saying P or Q is true or R is true. And in the case of a series of negations, to say P is true and Q and R are true is the same as saying P and Q are true and R is true. And again, the reason for this is that as we construct our proofs, there may be times that what we see needs to be translated into a different way of phrasing the same thing so that our proof can remain as clear as possible. So here it might be helpful to think in the plural sense, conjunctions to conjunctions, or disjunctions to disjunctions, ands to ands, ors to ors. Now the rule of distribution can be a little tricky for some. For others, it may be easily identifiable because you quickly lock on to the way the conjunctions and disjunctions are being combined. So with the distribution, on one side, we have a combination of and and or. For example, P and Q or R, or perhaps P or Q and R. So we begin with a conjunction, disjunction on one side, and we're going to convert that to the language of either and or and or or and or. So when we have a conjunction and a disjunction, if our main operator is a conjunction, then this can be converted into two conjunctions where the main operator connecting them in the proposition is a disjunction. So P and Q or R can be converted to P and Q or P and R. On the other hand, if I have a conjunction and a disjunction and the main operator is a disjunction, this can be converted into a statement with two disjunctions where the main operator is a conjunction. So when we involve a proposition containing a conjunct and a disjunct, distribution allows us to pair the first conjunct or disjunct with each part of the second conjunct or disjunct. Keep in mind though that equivalence does not always work in the same way. For example, sometimes we may encounter P and Q or P and R, and we need to remember that we can translate that to the language of P and Q or R. So in our proof, if we have one of these types of things and we need to convert it to the other, we introduce a new line, we introduce the translated or converted proposition, we note the line containing the proposition that we are changing, and then we identify that the way we came to this conclusion was by way of DIST or distribution.
Now we've already encountered double negation as one of our basic rules of inference or implication, and that is because we can easily infer that if something is true, it's not the case that it's false. But the basic rule we introduced there came in the form of a negation elimination. That is, when presented with a double negative, we understand that that is the same as a positive. But sometimes we may have a positive statement and need to translate it into the negative language. So if I have proposition P and I need to convert that to the language of it's not the case that not P, I can do so by introducing a new line and noting the line where P is found and noting that we came to the new line of information, not not P, by way of double negation. The rule of transposition, abbreviated T-R-A-N-S, is new in one way, but not in another. It is familiar in the sense that we should understand by now that a modus ponens and a modus tollens are equivalent. They both begin with if P is the case, then Q. They just flow in a different way in order to reinforce the idea that Q is a consequent of P. Modus ponens uses positive language and, if we're thinking of a mathematical scale, moves in a positive direction from affirming P to concluding Q. Modus tollens uses negative language and, thinking of a mathematical scale, moves in a negative direction from right to left and it comes in the form of not Q, therefore working back to P, not P. But both of them reiterate the point that Q rises or falls with P, and so they are equivalent statements. So this rule of equivalence, called transposition, says that I can translate if P then Q into the language of if not Q then not P. Similarly, if I encounter a proposition in the form if not Q then not P, I can translate this into the positive language of if P then Q. The rule of material implication is directly related to this, but if you're not careful, it may seem a little trickier. We still have a conditional if P then Q, and this can be translated into the language of not P or Q. Now think of what we've just said. If we have P, then we can use the modus ponens to demonstrate that Q is the case. On the other hand, if we have reason to doubt Q, we can use the modus tollens to cast doubt on P. Now we understand that what is equivalent is not the conclusion found in each of these two argument forms. Rather, the two argument forms themselves are equivalent to reinforcing the idea that Q and P are connected in this way. The immediate conclusion is contrary. Right? So, for example, with the moral argument in the form of laws and law giving, you might say if there is a moral law, there must be a moral law giver. There is a moral law, therefore, there is a moral law giver. Now, in the form of modus tollens, someone might argue if there is a moral law, there is a moral law giver, but there's no reason to believe there is a moral law giver, so there's no reason to believe there really is a moral law. So the immediate conclusions are very different. In one sense, you have God and morality. In the other case, you have neither God nor morality. Yet, although the conclusions are contrary things, they both reinforce the same idea that morality rises and falls with God, or that God and morality are directly connected so you can't have morality without God. So in one sense, the ultimate conclusion, not the immediate one, is the same. However, the immediate conclusion is very different, as you can see. Now, while understanding the ultimate conclusion is what is helpful in understanding the equivalence of the two argument forms, understanding the immediate conclusion of the two different forms is what will help you understand material implication. So with the modus ponens, if I have P, I prove Q. Q is the case. With the modus tollens, however, I have reason to doubt Q, 
so I have reason to assert that P is not the case. So one form is able to prove Q and the other is able to prove not P. So if the ultimate conclusion is true, in this case, that God and morality rise and fall together, or to say it another way, if our initial proposition is true, that if P then Q, then it will follow that either Q is the case, modus ponens, or not P is the case, modus tollens. So material implication allows us to convert if P then Q into the language of not P or Q. Or if we encounter not P or Q, we can convert this back into the language of if P then Q. We introduce a new line, we introduce the translation, we cite the line with the initial proposition that we are translating, and then we note that we came to this new evidence by way of MI or material implication. Be careful not to confuse material implication with material equivalence. The next rule, material equivalence, abbreviated ME, allows us to convert biconditionals into other logical connectives and vice versa. Here the hint will be in one form to look for the biconditionals. Otherwise, it might be helpful to remember, just like the four dots, the biconditional symbol, double arrow, technically means equivalence. When we say P if and only if Q, we are saying the truth value of P is equal to or equivalent to the truth value of Q. So if you encounter a biconditional, there are two ways you can translate this. Or if you encounter some combination of logical operators that are essentially presenting you with a form of equivalence, such as a conjunction informing you that if P then Q, is true and it's also true that if Q then P, then seeing that equivalence you can convert this back into a biconditional. Because we have already encountered and now understand the second version of this rule, that the biconditional P if and only if Q is the same as saying if P then Q and if Q then P. The move we are less familiar with is the first version of material equivalence. But you really need not overthink it, given what I just said. Understanding that the biconditional is really a symbol of equivalence, and P if and only if Q is the same as saying the truth values of P and Q are equivalent, and so here you might think back on those truth tables, this means that we're only going to end up with two possible scenarios in which P and Q are true, or P and Q are false. There is no scenario in which P is true and Q is false, or P is false and Q is true. If you understand that, then you understand that to say P if and only if Q is the same as saying either it's the case that P is true and Q is true, or it's the case that not P and not Q. So both are true or both are false. That is what the biconditional means. Next, we have the rule of exportation, abbreviated EXP. Exportation allows us to convert a conjunction into a conditional or convert a conditional into a conjunction. Now here you should note that we are talking about a sub well-formed formula. We are not talking about a situation in which we are presented solely with a proposition that is a conjunction, or we have a proposition that is only a conditional. We are talking about a situation in which we have a well-formed formula that contains within it sub-formulas that come in the form of a conditional or a conjunction. Those sub-formulas can be converted in order to help us solve the overall proposition. So if we have a proposition that comes in the form, if it's the case that P and Q then R. This is the same as saying if P, then it will be the case that if Q, then R. Because if we know it's the case that if P is true and Q is true, then R will follow, then if we know that P is true, we also know that if Q is also true, 
in which case P and Q are both true, then R will follow. And vice versa, if we encounter if P, then it will be the case that if Q, then R. We can convert this back into the language of if P and Q obtain, then R will follow. So in our proof, we would insert a new line, insert the new language or the translation, identify the line which we are translating, and note that we came to the new evidence by way of EXP for exportation. Our final rule is another concept we've encountered before, the tautology. This is abbreviated T-A-U-T. Recall that a tautology is an obvious, necessary truth. It doesn't need stating in common language, but there may be a need for it in a proof. And its purpose is really just to create a conjunction or a disjunction when all we have is a simple proposition. So if it's true that P, then it would also be true that P and P. And if it's true that P, it would also be true that P or P. So let's end with a few examples and a little practice. If you see A, if and only if B, therefore A and B, or not A and not B, which rule allowed the author to make this move? The answer is material equivalence. Hopefully you see the equivalence of the statement A and B have the same truth value or A and B have the same truth value. What about the next example? A or C, and if this is the case, then B if and only if C. Once again, we have material equivalence. Now try not to become visually overwhelmed once you see a lot of sub well-formed formulas in play. The only thing that changed from line one to line two was the biconditional B if and only if C changed to if B then C and if C then B. Okay, what about something more complex? X or not Y, and if this is the case, then Z. Not Z, therefore Y. How do we prove this? We can prove it by showing it's not the case that X or not Y, and so not X and it's not the case that not Y, therefore it's not the case that not Y, thus we conclude Y. Now pause the video to see if you can figure out which lines and which maneuvers the author used in constructing this proof. Here's the answer. Line 3 comes from lines 1 and 2 by way of a modus tollens. Line 4 then comes from line 3 using De Morgan's Law. Line 5 comes from line 4 using the rule of simplification. And then we can simply double negate line 5 to conclude y. Try this example. If g, then h. G is true and G is true, therefore H. Now we do not have the evidence that G is true. We only have the evidence that G and G. So we need to prove G and then we can prove H. And we do this by simplifying the conjunction in line two so that we have simply G. And then from lines one and three, by way of modus ponens, we can conclude H. And one more. B is the case, C is the case, therefore A or B is true, and A or C is true. Now this is unlike anything we've seen so far. How did the author move from two simple propositions to such a complex conclusion? Well, let's look at the proof. In line three, we conclude B and C is the case. In line four, we have A is the case, or B and C. And then we move to the conclusion A or B and A or C. Again, I encourage you to pause here and see if you can figure out the moves that the author is making in this proof. And the answer is B and C is simply a conjoining of lines one and two. Then we add an additional simple proposition A in line four. Now we have all the letter variables in play and pay close attention to what's going on in line four. We have a combination of or and and. Does that sound familiar? 
Well, we learned in this module when we encounter an and or statement to think either and or and or to think or and or. This is the rule of distribution. And so here we can take line four, A or B and C and convert it to A or B and A or C. This concludes module six. In the next module, module seven, we will move still deeper into propositional calculus. So until next time, think well, ponder long, and especially when it comes to these rules, practice, practice, practice.